It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this morning's communion brunch, Father Kevin P. Quinn, a member of the Society of Jesus, is a lawyer and a law professor. Since 2011, he has been serving as the 25th president of the University of Scranton. Father Quinn joined the Society of Jesus in 1973. Soon after graduation from high school, he received a bachelor's degree from Fordham University in 1979 while at the same time working as a community organizer in the South Bronx. During that time, he focused on disputes between tenants and their landlords, which began his interest in law. Father Quinn was ordained as a priest in 1985. He also earned a Master of Divinity from the uh, Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley and a Juris Doctorate from UC Berkeley in 1988. He worked as a law clerk in the United States Courts of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York City after completing his law degree. During his career, he has focused on issues in law pertaining to health care ethics, including stem cell research and end-of-life care. His writings and publications have focused on genetics, contemporary culture, and bioethics. A former professor at Georgetown and administrator at Santa Clara, Father Quinn is well versed in Catholic and Jesuit higher education, and we are fortunate to have you with us today. Father Quinn, Father Quinn, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you today, and I also realize since we've all eaten, we probably want to go on to the next phase of our afternoon, so I think I'll be about 10 to 15 minutes. But today, in our brief time together, I would like to take a moment to situate the work of Jesuit colleges and universities within the broader context of higher education in our country and then to ask the important question, what is unique about a Jesuit education? But before I begin that, allow me a brief shout out. As instructed by my sister-in-law, and we who have sister-in-laws recognize you need to do certain things. But I want to shout out to Bobby Chambers, who is in the audience today. He may not be in the audience today, or he may be. I think he is. Yes, very good. Bobby is a second cousin to my three nephews. I taught estate planning at Georgetown Law School, but I don't really presume that I got that right. What exactly is a second cousin? But Bobby is a second cousin to my three nephews. But more importantly, Bobby is an incoming freshman here, St. Peter's Prep class of 2017. Bobby, a great choice in schools. My friends, let's make no mistake. These are anxious times. Just consider incomprehensible death in Newtown, inexcusable gridlock in Washington, D.C., and serious political military crises around the globe, talks of guns, fiscal cliffs, and Syria, North Korea, or Iran just to name a few. In addition, how could we not forget Superstorm Sandy? Personally, my head spins. And of course, the world of higher education is not immune from this malaise of cynicism and despair. I've just returned from annual meetings of a variety of higher education groups, all sporting wonderful acronyms while each explored unique issues to a particular niche, three themes crossed all agendas. Debt, technology, and globalization. While not new, conversation around these themes is now more urgent than ever. A word on each is appropriate. To identify ad nauseum the troika of rising tuition, increasing student debt, 
and disappointing job prospects is now old news. Ability to pay captures well that story. The new challenge to higher education is willingness to pay. Those families that may have the ability to pay are now questioning the value proposition of spending oh so much money when returns on that invest investment seem mixed. These families are more likely to shop around for a bargain or to rely more on public higher education. In response to this new environment, private colleges and universities are searching for answers. For example, some have even reduced tuition with the hope of capturing these bargain hunters. Today's word, or more accurately, acronym in higher edu uh, education technology is MOOC, or Massive Open Online Course. It's been in all the news. That some elite universities now share their famous professors with the masses via internet challenges all colleges and universities to consider the role of online education now and not tomorrow. Of course, online education is already here, everywhere. For instance, the University of Scranton's graduate school has more students enrolled in online than on-campus degree programs. And I might just add parenthetically that our online programs are counted among the best in the nation. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Globalization is one of the most fashionable buzzwords of contemporary political and academic debate. Just listen to the talking heads on television. Mine is not to opine here about a more precise meaning for this elusive concept, but to highlight its ongoing importance in higher education, both discourse and practice. We live in a globalizing world, and university curricular and co-curricular offerings must address that reality. So, now the question. What is unique about a Jesuit education? The distinctiveness of the Jesuit education stems from its deep-rooted history and mission grounded in faith and intellectual rigor. Since its beginnings in 1548, when the first Jesuit institution opened its doors in Messina, Italy, Jesuit higher education remains committed to expansive and critical thinking, to service, leadership, and to care of the whole person. Jesuit higher ed education in the United States is one of the largest and strongest networks of private higher education institutions in the world. The 28 Jesuit colleges and universities are located in 18 states and in the District of Columbia and are independent yet united by their common heritage and mission. The Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, was one of the first orders of educators within the Catholic Church. A Jesuit education is grounded in the liberal arts tradition with a focus on quality teaching, critical thinking, and rigorous academic standards and scholarships. Today, U.S. Jesuit colleges and universities employ nearly 22,000 faculty members who continue the tradition of St. Ignatius. Jesuit higher education is guided by a spirituality that seeks justice. Inspired by the tenets of Catholic social teaching and its intellectual and social justice traditions, a Jesuit education places great emphasis on forming women and men for and with others, that students are engaged in a process of exploring the ways in which their knowledge and their talents will best serve society in the most distinctive and constructive ways. Allow me for a brief moment to describe what Jesuit education does well and will continue to do well into the future. Take the University of Scranton. Our vision statement reads, to provide a, a superior transformational learning experience, preparing students who, in the words of Jesuit founder St. Ignatius Loyola, will set the world on fire. In the 21st century, 
Any transformational education at a Jesuit university, in my opinion, should be engaged, providing students with opportunities for direct contact with marginalized communities, integrated, systematically melding academics with co-curricular activities, and global, in in encouraging study abroad and developing world immersion experiences. What is at the core of the transformation that we Jesuit educators envision in our students? Or how should we prepare our students to set the world on fire? Let me only begin to answer this question by suggesting that any Jesuit education must be rooted in its commitment to cura personalis. We Jesuits still love those Latin expressions. Cura personalis, our care for our students in their own uniqueness. More specifically, educators at Jesuit colleges and universities must know their students well enough to be able to encourage them to discern their vocation or, if you prefer, their passion in life. They should come to realize, in the words of theologian Frederick Beekner, vocation, a student's vocation, is where their greatest passion meets the world's greatest need. Today, to help students discern their vocations, Jesuits institutions throughout the country provide them with more than $1.3 billion in institutional aid, eight times what the federal government provides for Jesuit colleges and universities in federal grant aid. On average, 22% of students at Jesuit universities receive federal aid in the form of Pell Grants. This grant provides need-based grants to low-income undergraduate and certain post-baccalaureate students to promote access to post-secondary education. Last year, more than 217,000 students were enroll enrolled in Jesuit institutions of higher education on the undergraduate and graduate professional levels. Reflective of their rich academic experience, students at Jesuit colleges and universities have received Rhodes, Truman, and Fulbright scholarships. I might add, at the University of Scranton, since the early 1970s, over 140 of our students have uh, been awarded prestigious Fulbright scholarships, placing us among uh, the top 10 deliverers of uh, Truman scholarships on a national level. Many distinguished graduates from Jesuit institutions have reached the highest levels in their field, including former President Bill Clinton, scientist Anthony Fauci from Jesuit High School uh, Regis in Manhattan, journalist Maria Shriver, actor Denzel Washington, graduate of my alma mater Fordham, NBA coach Glenn Doc Rivers. Also, consider Descartes, Moliere, James Joyce, and even Fidel Castro, who were likewise tr trained by their Jesuit education. While some Jesuit alumni might be more recognizable than others, many share the distinction of using their education to serve and to lead. Of the roughly 1.9 million living alumni of Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States, there are 52 members, nearly 10% of U.S. Congress, two members of the U.S. Supreme Court, and more than 30 appointees in the current presidential administration. Countless more have assumed leadership positions as governors, mayors, and judges. The judge I worked for 20 years ago was an alum of both Fordham College, actually Brooklyn Prep, Fordham College, Fordham Law School. Jesuit higher education provides students the opportunity to become thoughtful, competent, and compassionate women and men with a commitment to the greater good and a passion for justice, preparing them for lives of leadership and service. It is through this distinctive mode of education that Jesuit colleges and universities are changing the world one student at a time. This would make St. Ignatius very proud. Thank you.
Thank you, Father Quinn. On behalf of the PrEP community, I wish to thank you for being with us here today. Father Quinn, would you come forward, please? This is so you never forget where you were. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> Father Quinn, you have another one. <laughs> you got <job. laughs> Thank you. Now, I guess we all know what this means. At this time, I would like to invite the members of the Vox. Uh, to uh, come forward and lead us in the pride and glory. <clears throat> Could everyone please stand? Have it here. Guys, have it right here. It is our pride and our glory, old in song and in story. And we cherish your name and we love your fair fame for the days of long ago. And we, your sons, will be loyal to St. Peter's so royal. May your banner still guide us wherever we go. It is a story of gladness with no shadow of sadness. Our you spend with you, St. Peter, so true, and you hold our hearts love yet. And through the years we will treasure with the joy beyond measure the gifts you have given we shall never forget.